I want to focus on the Dutch experience of repatriation of women and children and briefly discuss the long awaited decision of the European Court of Human Rights. And then finally, I want to conclude with uh, the implications for both the children and the women once they are uh, repatriated. So if you look at the Dutch repatriation of women and children, just to give you uh, a few uh, figures, approximately 300 persons have left for Syria and in Iraq, out of which one third is women. And so far, 100 adults and 25 children have already uh, died. And as of uh, the 30th of November, uh, 85 women and 70 children uh, have returned. The Dutch government was actually also always against actively repatriating their citizens and they favored a prosecution in the region, which has several human rights uh, concerns ranging from uh, poor detention uh, standards, lack of access to a defense council, unfair trials, and of course, the potential of uh, a death penalty. And in fact, uh, when uh, in the Netherlands they reached a coalition agreement, and that was approximately one year ago, in December of 2021, uh, the government had stated that they would only consider repatriation on a case-by-case -case basis. So there wasn't really uh, an appetite to actively repatriate all the women and children. But since early this year, the situation has changed after uh, a court decision uh, in the Netherlands. So initially, the strategy of the Dutch prosecutors was to open investigations while the nationals were still in Syria and in Iraq and build criminal files. Now, maybe it's good to mention at this stage that in the Netherlands, it's possible to have trials in absentia. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, the prosecutors believed by opening the investigations as early as possible, they would be able to minimize the risk of the threat the fighters pose, but they were also able to substantially shorten the time needed for the investigation once they would return to the Netherlands. And it would send a strong message to those who have joined and who plan to join IS that they will be prosecuted sooner or later. So trials in absentia are also common in many other European countries, such as Belgium, France, and the UK, but not in Germany. But the modalities and the conditions of trials in absentia differ from country to country. And trials in absentia are seen in, uh, some believe that trials in absentia are useful in the interest of justice especially when serious crimes have been committed, and it would also serve the interest of victims. So one could question whether only membership of a terrorist organization, in fact, constitutes a serious crime. And this is, of course, different when it comes to uh, prosecuting them for potential core international crimes. But trials uh, in absentia are problematic from a rule of law perspective. Uh, according to Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, an accused has the right to be present at their trial. And this allows them to effectively defend themselves and cross-examine witnesses, but also to have access to interpreters if needed. And standing trial also has a performative function. Seeing justice being done can be a powerful message also for others in society. But nevertheless, trials in absentia are not forbidden under international law, but they do need to meet, meet certain requirements. So one can ask, has the accused been not notified of the trial? Now, this can be done in the old days by regular posts, but I can tell you that it is also very often being done just by using social media. And the Dutch prosecutors have used Facebook and Twitter and other means to notify uh, the start of a trial. I mean, other questions that has to be taken into consideration, is legal representation possible if you are yourself not able to attend the trial? And is retrial possible if you indicate that you would want to be uh, present at time? So let's go back to the case in the Netherlands. 
The location of the Dutch women was known and the authorities had notified the women of the trial and they had exercised their right to be present at, uh, at the trial and notified the court of this. So as a result of this, the court had stayed the proceedings for six months and allowing the authorities to bring the woman to, to the Netherlands to stand trial. But they had extended and stayed the trials already a couple of times. And at some point in time, the court concluded that it was very unlikely that the woman would actually be repatriated and indicated that they would terminate the proceedings. And this has serious consequences in the Netherlands. This would mean that the women could no longer be prosecuted because of the NABIS and EDEM principle. And this means that a person is not allowed to be tried for the same underlying effect twice. And this would bar the prosecution in the Netherlands to prosecute these women um, for the underlying acts uh, they have committed. And secondly, when and if they would return, there would be no possibility to impose a long-term supervision because this would be only available uh, if it could be a uh, part of a prison sentence. So what we have seen now is that the Dutch have repatriated now five women and 11 children in May. And as Hans Jacob mentioned more recently in a joint mission with Germany, it has repatriated another 11 women and 33 minors. And it is to be expected that the remaining women and children will most likely also be repatriated in the near future. So the second point that I wanted to uh, briefly mention is the decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, it finally reached a decision in, in a landmark, land, landmark case in which grandparents initiated proceedings against France for their unwillingness to repatriate their citizens from the al camp in Syria. So the court basically concluded that France cannot be held responsible for the poor conditions in the camps and that there is no general right to repatriation. And then finally, the silver lining that France has not adopted or provided for uh, appropriate safeguards in its repatriation decision. So while some have celebrated the decision, others are more critical. And I'll try to explain briefly why. So the main issue in this case is what we call the extraterritorial jurisdiction of human rights. So this means states are generally obliged to respect the human rights of their citizens uh, within their territory. But there are exceptions. When a state has effective control over a territory or over persons, it also has jurisdiction. And this means that states have a positive obligation to respect and protect the human rights of those persons. So extraterritorial jurisdiction of human rights or the lack thereof has been a major concern in counterterrorism contexts. I mean, just to remind you of the rendition programs uh, or the use of drones in Afghanistan and Yemen, which has resulted in many civilian casualties. This also all deals with the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction. So the Committee on the Convention of the Right of the Child, the Special Rapporteur of Countering Terrorism while Respecting Human Rights, and the European Commission on Human Rights have all very clearly stated that France has jurisdiction because it has effective control over its citizens in the camp in Northeast Syria taking into account factors such as the nationality of the children, the relationship with the Kurdish authorities. They were already communicating uh, on a regular basis with the Kurdish authorities. And in fact, the ability of France to repatriate because it had already repatriated 35 children earlier on. So here is where the European court's uh, decision is disappointing as it concludes that it has no jurisdiction with respect to the conditions in the camp, whereas by repatriating the children, it would certainly not prolong this situation and their exposure to the poor conditions anymore. 
But on the right to one, enter one's own country, the court concluded that uh, in the current circumstances, it does have extraterritorial jurisdiction. So the court uh, says there is a jurisdictional link with France because of the conditions in the camp and the nationality and the length of detention. So there is a bit of a split, as you can see here. On the one hand, they say there isn't extraterritorial jurisdiction. On the other hand, they say there isn't. So uh, I think the lawyers amongst us will debate for a long time uh, this decision, but it can be seen as a symbolic victory. And we do see that uh, many European countries prior and after the ruling of the court uh, have expedited the repatriation of their citizens. And it is indeed true that the number of uh, repatriations has increased compared to the previous years. Not only Germany and the Netherlands, but also countries such as Denmark, Sweden and Finland have also uh, repatriated many more of their citizens. And recently, indeed, France and the UK uh, as well. So, what are the implications for the women and children uh, once uh, they have been repatriated? So if we look uh, at the children, over 80% of the children were born in Syria and, and Iraq and are under the age of 12 years. And so far, the children are predominantly perceived through a security lens. And first of all, it is not clear what this means. Do they pose a risk to themselves? or to their family, or do they pose a risk to society? And do they pose a risk now or in the long term? And is the risk that they would engage in criminal behavior or is it a risk that they would engage in terrorist activities? And there is currently no sound evidence-based research conducted on this so-called risk of children. And I think the question we should be asking, what are the needs of the children, considering their exposure to violence, indoctrination, poor living conditions, and possible multiple traumas they have uh, um, developed by not only going there, but also by returning. So the concept of the best interest of a child, which derives from the Convention of the Rights of a Child, has reached nearly universal status. And at ICCT, we'll be publishing soon a policy brief where we are going to take a rights-based approach to child attorneys. Um, so if you look at the best interest of a child, uh, it is threefold. It is, first of all, a substantive right. So this means whenever a decision is being made that affects a child, the best interest of the child should prevail. And it creates an obligation for states to directly apply it, and it can be invoked before courts. It's also a legal principle. So if a legal provision is open to several interpretations, the interpretation which is most favorable for a child should be taken into account. And finally, the best interest of a child is a rule of procedure. So this means that states need to demonstrate how they have taken the best interest of a child into account. So in our policy brief, we have unpacked the concept of the best interest of a child and hopefully will make it easier to identify which measures should be adopted, not only on the short term, but on the midterm and uh, on the long term to assist the rehabilitation and reintegration of children into society. And it will look into the core areas such as the child's view, so depending on the age of the child, you should take the child's view into consideration where they live, in which schools they go. It will look into identity, and that's not only about the right to a nationality, but it's also building the narrative who they are. It's about the preservation of family ties. And here we will also, you will have to look at the potential uh, uh, positive factors uh, that extended family can play, but also looking at potential risk factors. Um, other uh, areas that we will focus on are care, protection, and safety of a child, and what we call situation of vulnerability. And this means you have to take the specific circumstances of a child. 
a boy, a 16 year old is not the same as, uh, um, for example, a girl of four years old. And finally, health and education also uh, are factors, uh, core areas that can be mapped out both from short term, mid term and long term. So uh, when it comes to women, I think the first remark I want to make is that not all women pose a security threat. I think that some do, certainly, but I think we do have to flag this each and every time again. So prosecution where appropriate and then rehabilitation and reintegration. reintegration. And as Sophia indeed mentioned, some women also don't want to return. But when it comes to the women who have been repatriated, what we see now in most uh, Western European countries is that they are being arrested and are being prosecuted. The first wave of women that returned voluntarily in 2013 and 2014 are different from the women that are returning now. But we need to look further and try to understand for what crimes are they being prosecuted? And is this different than from the earlier women? And is this different from men? And what roles did the women play in the terrorist groups? And how is the relationship with the child being ma maintained while the mother is incarcerated? And are women being dispersed in prison or are they uh, being kept in uh, a separate wing for violent extremist offenders? And are rehabilitation programs the same as for men or do they need to be gender specific? And also do women encounter more or less difficulties in reintegrating into society? So these are just a couple of questions that we feel are really important uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, ICCT is very pleased to announce that we have received funding uh, for a research project for the upcoming year, where we will be addressing uh, these kind of questions. Uh, so the prosecution, rehabilitation and reintegration of female returnees and violent extremist offenders in four countries, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France and in Germany. And we will be organizing in the course of next year a live briefing and will also share our findings in a report. And we are very pleased that Mark Heckert from IFRI and Sophia uh, will be joining uh, the team of ICCT and will be contributing uh, to some parts of the research. So we are very keen to continue working uh, on this topic. And I also think, especially in light of the fact that now more women are being repatriated, it is important that we have a bit more of an ev evidence-based research uh, which can guide policymakers and practitioners how to deal with these issues in the near future. So with this, I would like to conclude. Um, 